Hello and welcome to another edition of Stepping into the Code. Today we're going to talk about modular object structure, which is a simple syntax that I use across all of my projects. And hopefully by the end of this video, you'll be able to look at something like this, which is a library um, and see a list of functions. Or you could look at something like this, which is an interface component. And you can see a list of functions grouped by category. Or you can look at something like this, which is an app. And yet it's still a list of functions uh, grouped by category. If you want to understand more about the distinction that I make between library component and app, look at the previous video on universal project folder structure. I'm gonna be using JavaScript in all of these examples here because that's what I work with primarily, but I have used the same pattern in Ruby on Rails and also Objective-C. So many of these things are hopefully language agnostic. So there's a couple things that I think are worth observing throughout this presentation. I'm gonna be talking about a lot of different things, but there's kind of three things that you can anchor yourself to. The first one is that this is a very flat organization of code. There's virtually no nesting. It's just like a giant list. Um, the second thing to observe is that everything is essentially expressed as a list of functions, right? Just a simple list of functions, comma separated. The third thing, we're using a very simple syntax, so you're probably going to understand that fairly quickly, but try to see how that simple syntax is being used to organize the code in different ways. So let's try and create an example of this simple syntax from scratch. Uh, you can see I've set up here uh, what I call a fiddle, which is essentially I'm going to type some code and then when I save the file, you're going to see some output in the terminal. Uh, this is just to help visualize what's going on. Um, it's not necessary to understand the rest of the presentation. So just as an example, I'm going to type in console, whoop, cons, geez. I'm going to type in console log and I'm going to say hello. And here on the left side in the terminal, you'll see hello. Um, so try and look between the two places. So uh, what's the syntax? For example, uh, the way I usually do this is I make a new variable and I call it mod, which is short for module. And I set that variable to a JSON object. And that's gonna be our house for everything. Um, so what, how you usually do this is you have something like alpha and then bravo, that's the syntax of a JSON object. And I can log that, um, just see what's there. So there's an object with alpha bravo. Um, in JavaScript, you can do something like this where you go charlie is a function that um, maybe it takes some input and it does something with that input. So I'm just going to log the input. Um, maybe I'm going to add a, an exclamation mark. And so what I'm going to do down here is I'm going to say mod dot Charlie, and I'm going to pass it hello as a string. And now I'm calling a function that's defined inside of that object. Um, and so there's this other thing that you can do to shorten this a bit further in JavaScript. You can just remove the colon and the function and just have it like this. So it's a very compact expression. Uh, it's still kind of key value uh, as a JSON object, but it's very like minimal. This is the syntax that I'm talking about. So we express everything this way. So for here's another example. Um, Delta is going to take some input and there's a comma. And I'm going to say mod charlie and I'm going to say input plus world. And so now at the bottom, I'm going to say mod dot delta and I'm going to pass hello, which will take hello, pass it into delta as input, and then delta will add world after that. And then it'll pass that to charlie and then charlie will log that out with an exclamation mark. And let's just add a space there. So you can see here what's going on, um, this flat organization, a list of functions separated by commas, and we're able to reference properties of this object from within other properties like this, uh, for example, within the delta function, or we can reference it from outside. Um, but this is essentially the syntax. It's a very simple, compact expression. The parallel in Ruby, uh, Ruby on Rails, Ruby would be something like a hash. And in Objective-C, it's maybe the, the things that you define inside of at implementation. 
Uh, it does, I don't think it looks this elegant in those other systems, but um, essentially the idea is the same. Like you have this list of functions, they're all sort of structured the same way, and it's a unified representation. So let's take the syntax that we've learned from constructing by scratch, and we're just going to see how it looks in real world context. Uh, we're going to start with a library, and here we have the OLSK string, or old school string, or I would just say the string library. And you can see here, it's the same idea. We have this mod variable, which contains, which is set to a JSON object. And we have this key value uh, structure, um, which is essentially a list of functions, comma separated. In the context of libraries, the order doesn't matter. You can notice here how each function has a prefix and essentially a globally unique signature. We do this because it becomes possible to find usage for any of these functions in the whole universe of projects. So for example, this actually that's not a good example. Let's go to um, string snippet. And so the advantage of having a globally unique signature in this way is I can just copy that and I can search across 90 repositories, or as it says, 2,422 files. I, I can see where it's being used, I can see how it's being used, but more importantly, I know exactly which function I'm talking about. If I had called this function snippet, then I could search for that and I would find different things. I would find, here's like a CSS class for an element that's like a snippet of something. You find all kinds of things. You're gonna have collisions. Here's like a bunch of text in a feature list where they say record short audio snippets. You have to do a little bit of work to sort of sift through these things to understand exactly what you're talking about. Whereas if you have a globally unique signature, you always know exactly what it is. And also, while you're in the context of other code, uh, for example, here I'm in another module, another library, I think, and uh, so I can see that it's using the string library and it's using the snippet function and then I can just click on this in my editor, maybe in most editors, and it'll just go right to the definition. And it, you don't have to worry about which snippet function is it because it's globally unique. So this is a very simple example of a library. Let's try to look at a more complex example. Here I've loaded the zero data wrap library. This is for integrating an app with the remote storage protocol or the fission protocol with the same API. You can see here, this is really long. It's about 1200 lines long, but it's essentially just a list of functions comma separated. You can see each function has a unique signature, global unique signature, and I can open any of these up and it's, they might be really big functions, but the structure, the syntax that we're using to organize the code is essentially the same as uh, the, the, the previous example. I might point out here that the order of these functions is roughly trying to be in order of invocation. For example, this object validation function, which you never call directly, it has an underscore, which means you don't really uh, invoke this directly. So it's gonna be called by other things. So we put this one at the top and then that thing will be referenced by something below it. This is a very rough guiding principle, but it's not it's not something very strict. So that's basically libraries. Uh, again, just to reiterate, list of functions, comma separated. We'll repeat this numerous times throughout the presentation just to make that super clear. That there is a fundamental similarity between all of these examples and it's also just very simple. Let's move on to components. So here's OLSK install. Just before I explain this actually in uh, both the previous videos, I've made this distinction between system A and system B. If you want more information, check the previous video in the link below. So seeing as system A has no JavaScript events, it's just rendering something statically. We're not going to be looking at system A components because there's no events. We're only going to be looking at system B. Because system B components are dynamic, they're event-based, they're responding to clicks and things like this, we're going to not just put them all together in a single list of functions. I mean, it is a list of functions, but we're going to group them in categories, sections, to aid with organization, and also, again, to make it easier to know where to look if you're trying to understand um, what's going on, if you're trying to make a change. So in this example, we can see our mod here with a JSON object, and we got some keys and values, and we have this shortcut to representing functions. 
and we have some different sections, value, interface, control, and lifecycle. I'm going to start at the bottom, talk about lifecycle first. This idea of lifecycle is something that actually comes from iOS or uh, iPhone applications. When the app loads, you get this message from the system, which is called view did load, which sort of translates to you're ready to like set up your interface and get things going. It's sort of like a, you can think of it like a setup, but I'm calling it lifecycle. And because we're going to have another section later called setup. And this is essentially where we start. And so we know that we're going to set initial variables or do some configuration, initial configuration, set initial states if we need to. And we can see what's going on here. We have this one function, lifecycle module did load. And we actually call this outside of the module. So we define our module. And then the first thing we do, and really the only thing we do, we want to just keep as much of the logic inside the module as possible. So we have this one call to lifecycle module did load, which calls this thing that does some setup stuff, and that's it. And then essentially we wait for some interface event to continue using the module. Uh, so that's lifecycle, it's at the bottom. And now I'm gonna go to the top, we see value, and oh. so here at the top we have a section called value. Value refers to the state of the interface. If there are certain elements on the screen that should be invisible, we can set that here. If we have to keep track of data, like a list of items that's going to be displayed, it would be here inside of value. It's essentially just state that corresponds to the interface. The next section is interface. This is where we respond to events that are triggered by interface elements. There's this button here. When we click that button, we call interface dismiss button did click. Long name just to describe that function. Um, and then what do we do inside that interface function? We call control. This is another pattern. We try to terminate as soon as possible. We want to avoid having long sections of logic and procedures and stuff. We want to try terminating as soon as possible and pass it off to somebody else. And in the case of the whole interface section, we don't actually want to do, let's call it domain specific logic in the interface section. The interface section is just like, I received a message from the interface, hand it off to somebody who can deal with it. Um, so in this case, we pass it off to the dismiss function, which does some domain specific logic. Um, let's look at the control section. So the control section is where we have our domain specific logic. This might seem like overkill that you know, we're just clicking a button, like, why don't I just call control dismiss directly? Um, the reason for that is one sort of separation of concerns where this is like interface related logic and this is like domain specific logic. But more importantly, you may have multiple interface events that can use a given control function, or you may have interface events that use multiple control functions, right? So when you click something, it may do multiple things or multiple things may do a certain kind of logic. And that's basically why we separate it. In this example, it's actually really tiny. I mean, it's like, it's barely like 40 lines long and yet we've divided it into four sections, right? It's not like it's super necessary to do it here. It's a paradigm that I use in the apps, which are enormous. And so I just try to be consistent and I do it even in the smaller ones because we start small and we tend to expand as things get more complex. So it's just good practice. So this is a kind of a simple example for components. Let's look at a more complex example. Okay, so here's OLSK catalog. We have a variable called mod. We set to it a JSON object. It's got a bunch of key values. Most of them are functions separated by commas. And because it's an interface component that's event driven, we separate it into these different categories. This is larger. In the previous example, it's fairly complex. There's maybe a couple hundred lines going on here, but we're using the same organization. You can recognize some of the sections here. I'm gonna go through them all and we're gonna see what's new. We're gonna start from outside the module and we're gonna work our way inside via the lifecycle section. So here I'm receiving this message from Svelte, which is on mount. It's sort of another way of saying like, oh, the component's about to load, go do something. I could just, call the function directly right here instead of waiting for on mount, but sometimes it, there, there are complex timing issues and we need like a legitimate event from the Svelte system in order to start our business. So basically I received this callback from Svelte saying the module is ready to mount 
and then I call my method, which is in the life cycle, life cycle section, and it's called the life cycle module wheel mount. Now we're inside the module. So let's look at uh, wheel mount. And you can see here, I've terminated as soon as possible because I'm not trying to do a bunch of stuff here. Um, this is designed to say, okay, the module's about to mount, somebody deal with this. And so we call the setup everything function, which takes us to the setup section. And this is another pattern, like usually when you're setting up an app or an interface, when you're initializing, you're going to have to like set some interface state or load objects or load variables or set whatever kind of setup. So I have this thing called setup everything, which as you can guess, it calls all of the other setup methods. Later on, I'm going to show you a way to even optimize this further so we don't have to have uh, setup everything. But Basically, that's what it is. So the setup section is for like setup related things. It's very close to lifecycle. And so we know there's some relation there. Each of these does a very specific thing. So basically the lifecycle section calls setup. Setup does all the setup. Um, and then we're done. And then we wait for interface events. So that's sort of the bottom end. Now I'm gonna to go to the top end and we're gonna see what else we can recognize here. So the first section, so the first section here is value. As we mentioned before, value is about state, interface state, and we have variables that we set. There is this pattern of trying to avoid setting the variables directly and using functions that will do the setting of the variables. Here, for example, I have this thing called value items all, which is essentially an array of all the items in the catalog. There is a simple variable here called underscore value items all, but we sort of treat that as private or like don't try to avoid touching that directly because oftentimes when you set one of those variables, there's some semantic meaning to doing that and it usually implies having to do a bunch of different things. So we encapsulate that in a function, which is named the same as the variable. And so value items all takes an input array and we do two things here. We figure out how many of those items are archived, and then figure out how many of them are visible. And we do both of those things in one, and then we set sort of the private variable. Uh, I don't always obey this, but it's just something I'm trying to cultivate here. But yeah, just keep in mind that value is for interface state. So let's look at the next section called data. There's only one thing in here. Um, data is sort of similar to value in that it's about state, but it's not something that you really have a lot of control over. It's essentially a state that's calculated from something else. I like breaking larger lists into smaller lists so that I can reason about them better. And as we'll see in the app example, there's gonna be a lot more stuff that we need to calculate in data. But value and data are sort of similar. We're talking about state of the interface. One of them is something that you set yourself. One of them is something that you calculate. Next section, interface, we recognize from the previous example. The next section is control, which we recognize from the previous example, wrapping domain-specific logic in small functions, trying to terminate as quickly as possible. After that, we have a section called message, which is new. And message is my word for callback functions from other modules. Uh, callback functions in general, actually, but most of the time it's relating to other modules. And you can see that I, I usually prefix the callback functions from the other modules. So I know that this callback function has to do with the OLSK narrow module. I know that this one has to do with OLSK collection. And so it sort of sorts itself because of the prefixes. And as we'll see in the app example, there's gonna be a lot of messages coming. So it's nice to have it in a separate section and it's also nice to have them prefixed so that they're sorted without having to do much work. The next section is setup, which we've already done, and lifecycle. So this is a more complex example of an interface component, but we can look at it and we can see it's essentially a list of functions separated by commas. And because it's event-based, we separate it into categories. Let's jump into an app. So I'm gonna use an example here of Hyperdraft and we're gonna to go to the app folder, the write folder, and we're gonna load up main.svelte, which is a massive file. And let's collapse or fold level two. Again, we have a variable called mod that is set to a JSON object, and there's a bunch of key value stuff in here. There's a lot of functions separated by commas, 
and we've separated into a bunch of different sections to aid with organization and helping make things easy to find. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to start at the bottom and we're going to work our way through the different sections. We're receiving this on mount callback from Svelte, just like the previous module. We call the setup everything function right here. And you can see we're just calling all of the different setup methods. Um, it's a bit cumbersome. I'm going to show an optimization of this later. And that's uh, that's it. It's similar. Uh, here, maybe the new thing is some of these setup methods are asynchronous. So we're doing an await here. And we can see that setup everything is an async function. So we're just sort of waiting, running the methods in order, and then we're done. Um, and then we're waiting for interface event. I'm going to talk about this React thing. Uh, later. So that's the bottom. Let's go way back to the top. Our first section is value. We have variables here that correspond to elements that are hidden or other aspects of interface state. Then we have the data section in which we calculate state based on what's going on in the environment. So the next section, mm, man, no, no. <clears throat> the next section is interface. Then we have our control section where we're wrapping up domain specific logic. We're trying to terminate as soon as possible. Then we have our message section. You can see that the message section is huge because this is an app. We're actually integrating lots of different components. And you can see how nice it is to have them prefixed because we can kind of get a sense. Um, if I wanted to make subheadings, even I could do that. But I, I don't really need to because it sorts itself. I know that these are catalog methods. I know that these are collection methods. I know that this is relating to the toolbar. I know that this is relating to the detail view of Hyperdraft where you can actually edit the text. Um, I have some zero data wrap callbacks here. It's a giant list, but it's also kind of neatly organized without me having to do much work. And then we have the React section. Most of the time, the interface should just update automatically because we're using Svelte, that's kind of the point. But sometimes updating the interface is a bit complex and we have to like wait for different things and we need like domain specific logic in order to update at the right time. So in the case of this, we have this react is loading function. This is our way of presenting the app in a loading state when it first loads. So when it loads in the browser, the app loads almost instantaneously, but it's not ready to use. And we do a bunch of setup stuff. We're setting up our storage client. We're finding all, we're setting up the catalog, which means we're fetching different items. These things can take a bunch of time. So after all those things are done, we present the interface ready to use, ready to type. The items are visible. And that's what React is loading is for. It's just a bit complex to do that automatically in Svelte. So we have a section called React to deal with those kind of things, updating the interface. And that's it. Um, so you can see how this really huge file of like a thousand lines is, again, a simple list of functions separated by commas. So that's an example of an app. And I'm going to quickly show an example of a different app just to see how much we can understand. So I've opened up Joybox here. I'm going to go to App. I'm going to go to Play. And I'm going to go to the main file. And let's fold level two. Just looking at the sections, we have our value section, which is for interface state. We have data, which is for interface state that's calculated that you don't actually set yourself. We have the interface section, which is responding to clicks and key down and submit. We have our control section in, where, in which we wrap domain specific logic. We have our large message section where we're receiving callbacks from various components. We have a react section to do complex interface updating that requires domain specific logic. And we have our setup section for initializing the interface and we have a lifecycle section for triggering the setup. Something I'm gonna draw attention to here is how there's no setup everything uh, just for curiosity, so again, we received this on mount event from Svelte, which calls lifecycle module will mount. And what we do here is instead of calling setup everything with, and then manually calling each of the setup functions, we just look through the module for all of the functions, all of the keys really of the object that start with setup. And then we call all of them in the order in which they're defined. So what this does is it called setup storage client, setup catalog, setup settings all. And somehow it even does the await. Um, I had some trouble making this work. I hope it works. But uh, this is basically the idea or what I'm moving towards for setup so that you don't have to manually call different things. You don't have to accidentally miss something because you forgot to call it. Like it just, if you call something setup and you put it in the right place, it's going to get called automatically. That's a nice little thing. But 
Looking at this again, you see how it's a list of functions separated by commas, and because it's a component, we're organizing it into categories, so it's a bit easier to understand. But I've, I've jumped into a completely different app with completely different domain-specific ideas, and yet you probably understand already how those domain-specific ideas are organized, which makes it very easy to get started. <clears throat> So a quick recap of everything we talked about. You know, we're using a modular object structure to organize code similarly across all projects. We have uh, three different kinds of projects that we looked at. First is a library, as we can see here in the zero data wrap library. It's just a list of functions, comma separated, roughly sorted by the moment that it's going to be invoked. We looked at uh, interface components like OLSK catalog, which is also a list of functions, comma separated but we segment those functions into sections so that it's easier to understand when they're going to be called. And finally, we looked at an app, which you can think of as a giant component that's, again, a list of functions, comma, separated, uh, segmented into sections so that we understand where to look if we want to make changes. In all of these cases, the underlying principle is to maximize transferable knowledge so that if you understand one project, you understand them all. So that's all I wanted to share for today. Thanks for watching. Uh, check the link in the description below for more information, and I'll see you in the next one. Ciao.